Thinking Aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. We are actually live right now. Uh, there's about a one minute delay. Oh, good. And uh, I'm going to switch the view for the moment to the gallery view. So if people tune in early, which is fine, it's always nice to have people turn in, in early. In fact, there are about 20 people already uh, watching us. So for those of you who are watching the live stream now, we're, we're just getting set up. We will officially start the program in eight minutes. I'm here with Debbie Jaffe Ellis, and uh, welcome everybody. Yeah, we look forward to addressing many of your questions uh, once we begin, but we wanted to log in early just to make sure that uh, technically everything is fine. And, and to my knowledge, everything is fine. And many, many more people are, are joining us now. So we're good here. Um, I guess I, I could we can we can converse before we get started. We'll have uh, people listening in. But uh, you, how how have you been since I've seen you last? Ah, uh, very well, thank you, and thankfully, and honestly, I attribute. Um, Rational Emotive Behaviour Therapy, largely to the fact that despite the chaos and confusion and COVID virus and um, a lot of people reaching out with, with great anxiety, understandably, so a lot, a lot of work uh, both in my profession and, and in a voluntary sense, um, I've been able to stay steady and calm and centered because I, I focus every day on what I can still be grateful for. I stay alert to what, if anything, I can do to keep me and others safe and to, to be productive. And long ago, I trained myself not to need certainty. When will this be over? You know, what if, what if, what if? So, a long-winded answer. Sorry, Jeff. No, that's fine. Yeah, so I'm doing well. I'm still uh, loving teaching at Columbia University um, in the Department of Clinical and Counseling Psychology and uh, doing various podcasts, doing some writing. I, I write pieces now and then for psychology today and uh, work on other writing projects, part-time private practice, go for walks by the Hudson River to keep my sanity more sane, <laughs> and I'm doing well. How about you? Well, um, life is actually very good. We get up every morning and exercise here in New Mexico. Lately, there's been a lot of smoke in the air from forest fires, so the, the air isn't as pure and clean as it often is, uh, but uh, I don't see many people. Most of my social activity is like this. Uh-huh. Even so though we're in the middle of a big city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Jerry Seinfeld uh, recently wrote an article in the New York Times in response to a lot of people who used to live here, moving away from the city and saying New York will never be the same again. And um, he expressed that the pulse is here and, and it's still New York. And so some people don't like that intense energy. It, it's I, I love it in addition to getting away from it now and then. So, um, yeah, New, New Mexico, New York City, different energy, but humans are humans wherever. And uh, if we think in healthy ways, we'll, we'll cope well with the challenges and, and love the good stuff even more. Mm -hmm. So uh, your book came out in a new edition last year. Uh, yes, 
it, it did, yeah. The APA asked me to update um, the book. Uh, the, the title will shock you, Rational Emotive Behaviour Therapy. Uh, it, it, it's part of a series that the American Psychological Association publish on all of the great psychotherapeutic approaches. And in its early days, it invited me and Al to do a book on REBT. It was just uh, a few months, unfortunately, before Al died that we signed the contract, said, yes, of course, with pleasure. So um, somewhat after his death, I, I put it together, but it contains a lot of his direct writing. So he is rightfully a co-author with me. And then um, a couple of years ago, I was asked to update it, which I did, and it came out the second edition last year. And my REBT, Rational Motive Behaviour Therapy, REBT students, that's one of the main texts. And a lot of people who aren't even students or therapists have written to me that they like it because it's got the basics. It's a small book, but it's like a primer of REBT. So, yes, it did come out. Well, um we're going to begin in uh, about two minutes. And I know I'm pretty sure there's a one minute delay, which I think actually means that to start on time, we should start a minute early. <laughs> okay. Although if I use any foul language, you know, that delay means you can kind of silence me, does it? Well, <laughs> does you know it what? On, on, on YouTube, it doesn't matter. So okay. we're, we're not on broadcast TV, but you know what I would like to do real quickly is, is just go get something to drink. So yeah. uh, I hope you have something handy in case you need it. I do. Okay. I'll be right back. And when I get back, we'll start. Okay. I'm not going anywhere. I wish I could see what those book titles are on Jeffrey's shelf and how many are similar to mine. I'm just doing fill-in repartee till Jeff comes back with his order. Hi everyone who's tuning in and uh, looking at beautiful statues. It's like Japanese statues of people meditating. And uh, what else can I tell you? I'll, I'll save it. I'll save it till Jeff comes back and asks questions, so I can hopefully tell you what you want to know about. Here he is. I'm back. Okay. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you all again. We're having another live stream, and I'm very honored to have Debbie Jaffe Ellis as my guest today. Debbie is the co-author with her late husband, Albert Ellis, of the book, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. And today is a very special day because it would be the 107th anniversary of Al's birth, if he were alive today. And, and there's his picture yeah, I, I feel so grateful that I had the opportunity to interview him a few times yes. back, back in the day. Um, you know, there's already a wonderful question that has come in from Philip Bernhardt House, who has also been a guest on this channel. And he asks, what has been the most difficult for you since your husband's death? Well, hi, Philip. Um... Oh, that's a question. What's the most been the most difficult thing? There have been a few difficult things. Um, I'm guessing Philip's question may relate to my professional life. I don't know if Philip can clarify if it's a more general question, but um, some of the difficult things. Okay, one has been feeling at times like a uh, a one-woman show, in a sense, um, because a, a few years before my my late husband died, before Al died, um, he was 
removed from the institute bearing his name and um, kicked off the board and, and there were lawsuits and uh, one of them was completed and Al was reinstated on the board but but by then he had no power on it and then soon after he got very ill for the next few, uh, well not few, 15 months declined till his passing and then the other lawsuits, he, he died, I couldn't afford to complete them. But um, so I, and he entrusted me to continue to, to present his work, to teach his work, to develop it to make it relevant for the here and now of, of my lifetime, which I do my best to do. But I, I really, I mean, I, I don't have any support in the sense of any institute or staff. So, Philip, one of the, the very difficult things has been, um, I don't want to say carrying the weight of that to imply it's a burden that I don't want. I embrace it. I, I honour it. It's my privilege. Um, and I, I very much want to do the best I can. And it, it's difficult at times to do as much as I want to do and also not um, being affiliated full-time. I'm, I'm a, an adjunct professor, which I love at, at Columbia University Teachers College, where Al, by the way, got his master's and PhD in psychology. Um, but if I had a full-time position, there might be research going on. And because of the paucity of research since Al's passing, and even before, compared to the excellent body of research uh, on CBT, REBT seems to be being neglected or marginalised at times. And, and sometimes I'm a guest lecturer at, at colleges and, and universities or for therapists or in practicums or CE workshops. And some of the attendees are amazed when I tell them that REBT is the pioneering approach that heralded in the cognitive revolution in psychotherapy. Beck acknowledges Al as having been, Tim Beck, the father of CBT, acknowledges Al as having been a mentor. REBT came out in the early 1950s. Tim, uh, I say Tim, Dr. Aaron Beck's work on depression 15 years later, you know, in the later part of the 1960s. And so there are these um, misunderstandings or, or the facts are not being taught as much as they were in my husband's lifetime. And so, Philip, another difficulty, and I use REBT to help me accept what I can't change and just keep forging ahead doing what I can, is to give REBT the prominence prominence it deserves. That's not to diminish the magnificent contribution of CBT and the research, but unsurprisingly, its research supports REBT because CBT is based on the premises of REBT. I favour REBT myself, and I'm not saying everyone should, um, because I believe and have experienced that it's more holistic that in addition to being scientific evidence-based with a solid cognitive component, more than other cognitive approaches, although they're starting to change, I notice some of them, it focuses in on educating us about emotions and knowing the difference between the healthy and unhealthy rather than putting the unpleasant ones in one basket and REBT more than others focuses on the vital importance if one wants to live a life and minimise suffering and maximise joy of developing unconditional acceptance of oneself, others and life. So, I, gosh, I'm being long-winded. I, I hope this is okay. I'll, I'll come to a close. I love your question, Philip. So one of the difficulties is, is accepting that as one human I I can only do what I can do and I strive to do better. Another difficulty is um, 
being aware from time to time of the injustice that took place at the end of my husband's life and, and the fact that we were not able to bring justice in in his lifetime, nor till now. But again, REBT allows me, <clears throat> excuse me, to accept that. And, and I don't harbour bitterness, fortunately. I just really don't like it when I think of it. But that's part of life. And then I focus on how I can be proactive. Another difficulty was um, the decline in health and, and death of my mother. Uh, the decline started soon after Al died and then she died just a few years later. So um, I think uh, they're some of the main ones. There probably have been others, but truthfully, truthfully, I feel so grateful that every day I feel grateful <laughs> and that I focus on what still is good and that's my habit. And I, I use it on better days and I've used it on really tough days and it, it helps. It brings perspective and, and allows me to cherish life. I'd rather be alive and cope with, with the challenges and pain than not. And I... I value what's good, and there's plenty of good. Uh, thank you for that uh, answer. You know, it, it dawns on me, Debbie, that a number of our viewers probably are unfamiliar with some of the jargon that you use when you say CBT and REBT. It, uh, some of our viewers are are just not up to speed with those terms. So we're referring to cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. Was, I'm guessing it's very likely the major school of psychotherapy these days. And our EBT is a predecessor developed by your late husband, rationally motive behavior therapy. But it, in a word, to me, those both of those uh, therapies are based on the idea that if you change the way you think, you can change your life. Very, very well and succinctly said. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And Al was very much influenced by Stoic philosophers and Eastern philosophers. But going back to the Stoics, um, Epictetus said, it's not an event, but our perception of it, or words similar to that. And Al acknowledged that he brought that in to our EBT. Indeed, the, we're all, let's say, those of us who are cognizant, aware of, well, that's an overgeneralization. I don't know if we're all, but many of us are aware of what's going on with the COVID virus, right? But not everyone is experiencing the same emotion about it. A lot of people are very much freaking out, anxious, depressed, and other people are feeling, and, and I'm grateful to be one of them, calm, stable, certainly not joyful <laughs> about that very, very concerned, extremely concerned. But I and others refuse to allow that to be the sole focus of our life right now. And it seems that many people who are suffering from anxiety or depression or other debilitating emotions are giving predominant focus to that and not thinking things through. And so that's one example of countless examples of it's not what's going on, it's not an event, it's not what someone says to you that creates our emotion and, and as you put it, our quality of life, a better life. No, it's the way we think about it, our attitude and our perception. And one of the things I love about REBT is that rational emotive behaviour therapy, as, as Jeff clarified, which is more than just a, a therapeutic approach. It's also a way of life for those who choose to adopt it as such. So it teaches us the difference, the clear difference between rational and irrational thinking and healthy and unhealthy, unpleasant or less comfortable emotions. 
We have a, another comment from Philip who asked the first question. He says, thank you so much. He, as a fellow adjunct, he appreciates and empathizes uh, with your difficulties on that front. And he adds that you're coming through these bereavements is a great inspiration to him. Oh, thank you, Philip. I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. And uh, we have an interesting question from John Dixon. He's referring to borderline personality disorder. He's suggesting that there's a controversy in terms of the diagnosis and the symptoms. And he wonders if you have any thoughts about uh, that disorder, borderline personality disorder. Well, if you're asking about rational emotive behaviors, therapies, uh, application to that, uh, that condition can be one of the more challenging ones. But if a client is determined to work on changing, and, and that is key, and some, not all, some clients who experience that condition don't necessarily want that much to change or think that they're wrong. And so that can be one of the more challenging um, conditions to work with. Nonetheless, usually with longer term REBT therapy, where someone, again, yeah, it's hard to generalize because you've got this broad diagnosis that every individual experiences and expresses it in different ways and to different degrees. But in, in generally speaking, if the, the borderline client can come to be willing to reflect on perhaps their life might be better if they were willing to work on modifying certain attitudes and behaviours, then maybe they might give some of the activities a, a try. REBT gives homework activities or activities that a client does between therapy sessions. REBT is not one of the therapies that it wants a client to get dependent on therapy, but with something like borderline and OCD at times, and addiction issues. Um, a client benefits from longer-term psychotherapy. Other clients who don't suffer from some, such extreme uh, ways of living and being, REBT is a brilliant brief therapy. You know, sometimes I do a demonstration where I'm doing workshops and in 20 minutes a person says, I never thought of like of, of it, whatever we're discussing like that, and, and wow, wow, wow. Now, an epiphany alone isn't enough. That's the beginning and then it's important REBT reminds us to make ongoing effort, ongoing effort, ongoing effort. So for many people, REBT is a brilliant and effective short-term therapy if they continue to make effort on what they learn in therapy sessions. For borderline, it will, in all probability, uh, take longer. Now, many of the borderline people and people with OCD that Al and I worked with benefited from a, a period of individual therapy and then often a period of individual and group therapy. And as they improved, many of them, not all, and it's very common for there to be relapse, but you know, then you encourage the person to, that's what a fallible human can often do and one begins again. Um, so uh, then can go to just group therapy alone, REBT group therapy. Um, this does and doesn't relate to your question. It does because uh, one of the things I've said is it's not enough to have an epiphany or an awareness or a wow, that's a start and then ongoing effort, ongoing practice. And there's a common kind of joke in New York City and maybe it's spread that, you know, how, how do you get to Carnegie Hall and innocent tourists ask wanting direction but a 
a therapist might answer, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. You know, if you're a musician, you want to work there, you better practice, practice. I walked past Carnegie Hall yesterday and there's a, a sign up there, um, an elegant one, of course, that says, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Patience, patience, patience. Because, of course, now it's, it's not open and people are missing live performances and being with others where they can share the joy of, of experiencing magnificent music or other forms of entertainment. And that's also a part of REBT. Sorry, I'm diverging a bit. I, I hope I sufficiently answered your question. Um, because this isn't a professional practicum, I, I feel I won't go into any more specific detail on, on Borderline now. Uh, because a lot of the people watching, from what I understand, aren't necessarily therapists. So I hope I've answered your question. Um, and just to finish off before going back to Jeff on patience, 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 uh, a large uh, part of REBT, or an important part that's encouraged, is what's called high frustration tolerance, HFT, that we remind ourselves we can stand what we don't like or what's really, really bad. We just don't like it. That helps prevent freak out and anxiety. The opposite of that is LFT, low frustration tolerance, or I can't stand itis. I must have what I want, when I want it, little baby that I am. You know, or impatience, impatience, instant gratification desired or demanded. And REBT urges us in this world, this physical world of us finite humans, where it appears nothing apart probably from death is certain, we better work on not liking what's not to like and working passionately to change it, injustice, immorality in any ways, etc. But on accepting, you know, as Renal Ray, what's that? Niebuhr, Reinhold Niebuhr said in, in the Serenity Prayer, to, to change what we can, accept what we can't, have the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, so John Dixon adds that, uh, yes, he was asking if REB could have success with borderline personality disorder. And he yes. thanks you uh, for your answer. Laura Newbert, who is one of our moderators, uh, is asking, uh, for which diagnosis would you say REBT is the most effective? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't narrow it down to one, really. I would say it's most effective in a shorter time for people who are fortunate enough not to suffer from any psychoses or, or difficult conditions such as the ones already mentioned, uh, and then it can become a way of life. It, it works well, obviously, with people who understand the principles. Now, one of the beauties of REBT is that it, it's basic wisdom, profound and yet basic wisdom imbued with with ethical stands and, and morality, but it expresses the tenets of the how-tos of achieving and applying those things in simple ways. So if a person isn't cognitively impaired, if they can understand the principles, and more importantly, if they're willing to make effort to, to push themselves, to think about their thinking, to, to monitor their emotions. Is this healthy or unhealthy? Is this grief right now, which is healthy, or depression and hopelessness, which isn't? Okay, so when you identify healthy or unhealthy emotion, if it's unhealthy, the next step would be, all right, what am I telling myself? Because it's not that much the circumstance. It's predominantly what I'm telling myself that's creating this debil debilitating emotion. And we identify the beliefs and then dispute them 
and come up with healthy new beliefs that we repeat and repeat over time and then they become our, our automatic go-to. Neuroplasticity reminds us that it can take, well, at least 30 days, but it's possible to change all neural pathways or former habitual ways of thinking into new healthy ones. So the people who benefit the most are the ones who can understand the principles, who believe that their life potentially could be happier than it may be at the time they're reflecting on this, who are willing to make the effort to change their thinking, to monitor their thinking, behaviour and emotions. And also, in addition, to care about other people. One of the many myths over the decades about REBT and one is it's too abrupt. No, it's imbued with compassion. Now, Albert Ellis sometimes had a very abrupt tone, but he had a heart of gold and it was tough love and wanting to shake people out of complacency. You know? So, um, it, yeah, so, so for people who understand and are motivated and make the, the effort, then it, it, it's very effective and often in not that long of a time and sometimes in a very short time. For people with more complex conditions emotionally and cognitively, it can take longer. The people it won't work for, maybe it's easier to answer it in that way as well, uh, people who, because they suffer from psychotic illness, are not able to consistently be in touch with a, a sense of reality as we know it, where actions have consequences and so forth. People who, who do live predominantly in a delusional state, uh, now, some people with psychotic conditions, when they're on appropriate medication, do reach a level of stability and clarity in which they can apply some principles of REBT, even one of its essential ones of unconditional self-acceptance, that even though I have this condition that is a handicap in this life, I'm not a handicap and I have worth simply because I exist. That's one of the tenets of REBT. We're not what we do. You know? Our worth isn't dependent by what we do, how we look, what we have, our talents, or, or what we're bad at, or even evil actions or saintly actions. REBT asserts that every human has worth simply because we exist and let us strive to do more good for ourselves and for others and for the planet and the environment. And yet even if we don't, it's a, a great pity, but that person still has worth. REBT asserts that's a hard one for a lot of people to digest, but it's worth making the effort to do if they don't want to live with hatred and bitterness, which, by the way, REBT acknowledges the mind, body, emotion, cognition, connection, body. And there is an abundance of solid scientific, I'm talking Journal of the American Medical Association material, that supports the fact that when we experience unhealthy emotions, it impacts our physical health. One of my dearest friends is, is a noted cardiologist here in New York, New York City, and she showed me an issue of, of JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, and an article showing that a person who experiences daily gratitude um, has healthier cardiovascular system. And most of the article I totally could not understand. There's graphs and chemical terms and this and that. But the conclusion is daily gratitude, better heart health. And, and there's, again, an abundance of proof of that. So um, I, I hope, again, my, my responses, uh, I know they diverge a little bit from the original question, but I hope this is of value. Um, Yes, REBT can be of benefit to people what 
no matter what the diagnosis, if they're able to some degree or healthy degree cognitively and are willing to make effort. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, here's a question from uh, Derparia1. These are undoubtedly not actual names, but YouTube names. And uh, this person asks, can you give an example of an exercise that could help grow acceptance and patience? An exercise. Well, a number come to mind. But here's one of the most powerful things in my experience um, personally. You know, I applied this when some people were acting very badly against my husband and I around the time he was kicked out of his institute for no good reason. <laughs> um, and it worked, it worked, it worked. And I've seen many other people apply it and it works. So if it works, I'm happy to recommend it. <clears throat> if one genuinely, genuinely wants to develop greater unconditional other acceptance of people, let's say, who have acted really, really badly. If we're aware that hanging on to hatred of them is hurting us and it isn't affecting them not one bit. My husband originally came up with this saying that now I hear all over the place, hanging on to bitterness and hatred is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. They're not going to die, you, know, you might. So it's a choice. First of all, it's a choice. Okay, so how, how, how? If a person who makes that choice is willing to contemplate the fact, I believe it's a fact, that if they were born, and by the way, they were once an innocent baby, just like all of us. If any one of us was born with their genetic makeup, with their biological tendencies as they grew and developed and the brain grew and developed. If any one of us may have had unfortunate circumstances in our childhood, teenage years, again, while believing and thinking, perhaps having been indoctrinated with beliefs and ideas that an objective person might think were discriminatory and hateful and perhaps evil. If any one of us in our adult years might have again been indoctrinated or believed certain things or been accepted into a group and made to feel special by these people who preached some very nasty beliefs or ideas, if any one of us would have been thinking what an evildoer was thinking when they did the evil act, having their genetics and brain chemistry and thinking what they were thinking, isn't it likely that any one of us might have done the same thing? Now, that's not in any way to apply. So just accept bad things happen. It's not to encourage complacency. REBT is all for taking action to bring justice whenever it's possible. But if we do so from a place of stability and non-hatred or hatred of the evil actions, but not hatred of the person, it's not saying one should love the person, although some saintly people may have achieved that. You know, there, there was an example, and there are many examples, but it, it often comes to mind first a few years ago in church in North Carolina, a, a young, disturbed, troubled man, troubled man joins a Bible group and 
afterwards pulls out a gun and murders the preacher and the attendees. And, and that same, within that same 24 hours on the news, parishioners and relatives of some of the people killed say, we forgive him, we forgive that troubled person. So there's evidence it's doable. It's important that we make the choice to do it, however. If we're invested in hatred and don't want to change, it's not going to happen in all probability. Now, a very good outcome of being able to work on that, and by the way, it's unrealistic to expect that that will happen overnight. It might for a rare few, but it might not for lots of people. So ongoing reminders, ongoing identification of irrational, hateful ideas just fueling hate and not changing anything. So ongoing effort and, and a beautiful consequence for some or many may be in time forgiveness, not of the action, but of a fallible, disturbed human being who did evil acts. So that's not so much an exercise um, as much, well, it, it is, I mean, it's an activity to be willing to contemplate that on a daily basis for at least 30 days and onwards um, if one is sincere about not wanting to harbour hatred and wanting to accept. The reality is in this finite life there will be pain, loss and suffering. And a lot of people who add to, to their suffering demand it shouldn't be that way. Of course, preferably in a perfect whatever that is world, it wouldn't be that way. But this is an imperfect world. And right now there is pain and suffering and injustice. And thank goodness that a large number of people talking about what's happening right now are peacefully taking action, demonstrating in service of what they believe is justice. Great. And hopefully most of them are doing so from a calm state and not wanting any violence. I think that's true from what I observe. Anyway, so that's my talking about unconditional other acceptance. I, I'd like to say a few words about how do you get unconditional self-acceptance. Uh, a lot of people suffer from guilt and shame and, by the way, uh, those emotions, along with hopelessness, depression, despondency, are often, are often present in people who attempt and sometimes succeed in, in suicide, committing suicide. So it is so important not only for the survival of people who may be emotionally vulnerable, but also people who are not so emotionally vulnerable and who want to, again, live a life with more joy and less misery, despite and including the fact that there will be some loss and suffering in this life in all probability. So how does one achieve unconditional self-acceptance if we've done bad things in our opinion, committed bad behaviour, others had suff have suffered as a result and how do we get rid of shame and, and guilt and accept ourselves unconditionally? I, I'd like to share with you um, a conversation I had with a, a very fine man um, just I think it was a couple of years ago when I was doing a workshop and when I do workshops I often ask for volunteers so I can demonstrate and um, it, not role play I, I say please I don't want to do role play is anyone willing to volunteer with a real issue what you're going through now so this this man came up and um, he he was studying psychology. He wanted to be a counsellor. He was more a mature age student, uh, I think in his late 30s at the time, you know, not in his 20s like most of the students in that class were. And he said, look, I understand what you're saying. I, I agree 
intellectually. You know, I, I agree, I love REBT. I agree with the principles of unconditional self and other and life acceptance. But I'm having a real hard time applying it to myself, he said. He said, I, I don't have that much trouble applying unconditional other acceptance, but I'm not able at this stage to apply it to me. He shared that in his younger years, not that the late 30s is older, but maybe it was, I don't know, late teens, early 20s, I'm supposing. He got in with a, with a crowd of people maybe, uh, committed a crime and, and he was imprisoned for that for a number of years. And he was still harboring the great shame about that. Um, the guilt about wasting all those years, tremendous guilt about the pain his family went through when he was incarcerated. And he did not feel he had worth. The goal of unconditional self-acceptance is to have a conviction that I'm a worthwhile human. Yeah, I'm fallible. I might screw up at times but I have worth just because I exist. So he was saying, and I, and I, in all honesty, I, I don't feel I have that much worth. I don't feel worth. Now, earlier in the conversation with him, I heard and got the impression that he loved nature very much. So I said this to him. I said, you know, I noticed outside a most magnificent, um, most magnificent college grounds, beautiful trees, and there's a pond and ducks and geese. But I noticed one really old banyan tree, and and it had a whole lot of parasites growing on it and from it. And students, you know, at the college had had carved in initials and so forth. And um, I said to him, you know, it's, it looks really old and, and it's shedding and it's, you know, I've got these initials. Don't you think it would be really good if uh, the people who take care of the grounds remove that tree and, and put in a fresh new tree to grow and, and flourish and bloom and it can be a symbol of new beginnings? And he immediately said, no, no, very passionately. And, and I said... Why not? And he said, I love that tree. Sometimes I sit underneath it. it. It's beautiful. And I said, but it's kind of flawed and, and a little ugly, you might think. Or, and, and he said, no, it's, it's beautiful. And then I said to him, are you any less a part of nature than that tree? And he got it and he started to cry. And he understood that even with his flaws of what he had done or not done in the past, he still had worth with and including past and present flaws. And as a postscript, I'll say he graduated and he's helping a lot of other people. So uh, another long answer. I, I hope those two examples of, of, of what we might choose to contemplate if we sincerely have a desire to develop greater and stable, unconditional self, other and life acceptance, that that's helpful for you. And to conclude this long answer, when we achieve that, and I'm not saying absolutely, because, again, it takes ongoing effort, so I'm, I'm not saying perfectly, but much of the time. My observation and experience has been that there's a certain calm and tranquility and inspiring quality that can help other people as much, if not more, than any words we might say. 
simply by our being and our attitude when stuff happens that we're not thrown or we don't agree with the herd mentality of this is awful or la 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 la, but we're stable, we calm, we acknowledge what's really, really bad, we explore what can we can be done individually and perhaps as a group, and our calm and our stability can act as a model to other people who are feeling frantic because they don't know or haven't applied the philosophy and or tools that REBT and other, (laughs) REBT isn't the only font of wisdom, but it's a great one. (laughs) Here's a question from uh, Music Monkey Man 1. Who, <laughs> quite a name. I'd like to hear Music Monkey Pan- Man perform and watch him dance as well. But anyway, <laughs> I'll imagine. Well, Music Monkey Man asks, what about people who self-medicate? What about them? It's... Yeah. Um, people who self-medicate either don't know a healthier way to find relief from their pain and anguish or another possibility is they do know of other ways but they think it's too hard or I couldn't be bothered or tomorrow and self-medicate either to relieve pain or increase pleasure in a sense. The problem with that is addiction. Um, So um, if the self-medication is self-medication that's been endorsed by a professional or someone in the know, you know, it depends what they're self-medicating with, (laughs) then maybe it's okay. But if it's something that doesn't lead to stability, self-sufficiency, self-acceptance, and takes one to a place of maybe shorter-term relief, but distraction from the real issues and maybe attending to the bottom line issues of, of if it's not physical suffering, emotional, what's behind that, identifying it, finding the core beliefs, disputing them, coming up with healthy ones, then it's a pity because it can be in that instance disempowering and a person may lose the ability to fulfil an amazingly creative, hey, music monkey man, potential. Um, Some people, if we're talking about certain substances, say I become more creative when I have this. And and I I can't dispute that if that's a fact, but I think if the the substance is used in excess, um, it would be worthwhile to weigh up the benefits outweighing any harm from reliance and inability to focus real well and maybe at times lethargy, at times hyperactivity, maybe not being mindful and clear of bigger pieces, you know, so weighing out pros and cons. So it was a very general question and I've given somewhat of a general answer in conclusion, as I complete this answer, but keep asking if I haven't fully answered it, um, self-medicating if it has benefits and no detriments, okay, that generally would happen if the person is very informed about what they're medicating with and preferably unless they're already uh, in the medical field, are doing it under supervision or or good counsel. Um, If it comes to 
other substances, again, weighing up the frequency, the ability to function without the substance, um, and the fact that, coming back to what I started with, more often than not, I think self-medication is attempt to, if not enhance creativity, avoid pain, avoid effort, make life easier, but that usually happens short-term and maybe not lasting in a way that if one were, even in addition, if not instead of, willing to, well, when I want to self-medicate, you know, what am I, how am I suffering or how am I wanting to be different that I might not be able to achieve without it? Let's try it as an experiment. Anyway, general question, broad, wordy, but kind of general answer. I hope it's helpful. And here's a question from David Wood, who is a, a fine artist. Uh, he asks, how does REBT, Rational Motive Behavior Therapy, impact on the creative mind? For example, let's look at Vincent van Gogh, or van Gogh, as they say in, in the Netherlands. Some aspects of mental health or mental disease can contribute to the creative mind. How do we know Van Gogh, did I say it right, wouldn't have been as creative if he didn't have mental disease? We can't really prove that. <laughs> Nonetheless, I don't believe that REBT in any way stymies <laughs> creativity. And I do think it has the potential to allow a person to maximise their talents and creativity. How? Let's start with the fact that when a mind isn't chaotic, when a mind is calm and stable, then sometimes incredible inspiration can be recognised. There's no distraction from that. At other times, if a person is in a state, let's say, of despair or anxiety and depression and, and, and expresses it on a canvas, not to deny that might be incredibly powerful and impactful. But there's no evidence that that artist might not be able to create something of a different energy, but equally profound impact if they weren't suffering emotionally. So I'm not going to deny that some magnificent artistic, be it uh, image or musical or writing, has come out um, during a person's depth of suffering. There's no denying that. But the question was, can REBT help a person's creativity? And it definitely can in the way I've described that if, if a mind is clear, certain things can be recognised and worked on. Inspirations can be addressed that may not have been recognised if the mind is worrying about other mundane or non-mundane things. Albert Ellis wrote hundreds of lyrics to popular tunes of his day. He called them rational, humorous songs. I, I'm, I'm looking down to see whether I have any on hand. I, I might. Maybe later I'll torture you by singing you a song. And, and he, he wrote them to kind of give a humorous view on how 
fallible humans can create their own misery, you know, and, and just taking a lighter look at what we can tend to do. Um, Humour is one of the uh, elements that em that's emphasised in REBT as being a, a, an effective way to put difficult things into perspective so that we are less likely to suffer debilitating anxiety, depression, rage. Now, REBT teaches that it's important to experience healthy emotion. So if something is, let's say, extremely concerning, REBT isn't saying get rid of your anxiety and be happy again. REBT is recommending that we be mature <laughs> and realistic. But experience concern, which allows us to be stable, which doesn't impact in, in such a negative way our physical health and enable us to probably make more productive actions, if that's called for, than if we're suffering from the unhealthy debilitating emotions. So um, humour um, can... Uh, shall I give this example? Yes, I'll give this example. So, uh, talking to myself. Um, no, I'm talking to you. Uh, Albert Ellis had had a, a, an, a high intellect, and often with high intellect comes high wit. Not always. He had, in the opinion of many, including me, magnificent wit. And, um, you know, along the lines of a Mark Twain, really, at times, he reminded me of Mark Twain, um, and applied the use of humour, not only by writing these humorous lyrics that, that scores and scores and probably over the decades, thousands, maybe millions of people sang in, in his and then our workshops, but also in our personal life. And in 2003, Al, uh, without taking time to go into the long story, nearly died. I, he fell back in bed one day and rushed to hospital and they found his large intestine was massively infected and, and almost ready to explode, which would have killed him. They had to have emergency surgery immediately to remove it and they, their plan was to give him an ileostomy bag which they successfully did he he lived another four years but anyway so we're in the hospital he's on the verge of it if it explodes he could die he understands it's very grave they're wheeling him into the emergency operating room and as we're going till we get to the door beyond which i couldn't go i'm explaining al you know it's massively infected and they're going to remove it. Um, you'll still be able to eat. And his main concern, will I be able to work? And you'll still be able to work. You'll adapt. You'll be there. Blah, 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 blah. So he says, so they're, they're removing my, my large intestine, huh? And, yeah, without blinking, he says, at least they're not taking my balls. Hmm. Now, not everyone might like that sense of humour, but um, how many people about at the age of nearly 90 going in for emergency surgery could call in on, on their ability to, to find, a, say something humorous? The benefit? Less anxiety. Oh, do you think he was happy about it? No. Of course he was concerned, but he was in the habit of not allowing himself to make himself anxious in dire circumstances. And he had many throughout his long lifetime. And humour was a great tool. Anyway, I I've, I've may have delved a, a little from the original question, but uh, whilst, yes, creative people have produced impactful, powerful pieces of art or music or writing whilst in the depth of pain, so have people who haven't been 
in the depths of pain and REBT can help. Very good answer. Here's a question from Eliel Bids, who asks, uh, and I think you partially answered it already, how can one soothe oneself in situations of paralyzing fear? So the first step, Eliel, I hope I have your name right, is just breathe, okay? Breathe, breathe. You're still alive. Let's say I'm talking to the person who's experiencing that debilitating fear. Okay, breathe, breathe, breathe some deep breaths. I'm still here, I'm still here, you could tell yourself. And then at some point, what am I telling myself? What am I telling myself to create this fear? Not everyone around me is feeling this fear. So there, there are some things I'm believing that are creating this fear because if the situation was so grave that every human was terribly afraid, then I would just, you know, have to accept it. But no, no, I'm thinking something. I've constructed this fear because of what I've told myself. What is that? Because if I can construct certain beliefs, I can deconstruct them and I can replace them. And so the first thing, so I'm not suggesting a person, you know, tell themselves that little mini lecture as if, as if a person in fear would. I'm, I'm just broadly talking here and there to the point, I hope. The first important thing would be to calm themselves and be willing to think things through. What am I telling myself that's making myself so terrified? And in all probability, they're telling themselves something that includes catastrophizing, awfulizing, or demands, it shouldn't be this way, or, or it's awful and it's never going to get better. And other such irrational beliefs, one of the things that makes a belief irrational is that there's no evidence to support it. And so once the person identifies the beliefs that are creating the debilitating fear. The next step is to question each of those beliefs. Where's the evidence? So let's say one of the beliefs is people around me are being careless, they're not wearing masks, and I might get COVID and I might die. That, that might be a current idea in some people's heads that creates deep fear. And they're probably telling themselves it would be awful and terrible and they just can't stand that probability they tell themselves. So the next step is to dispute those thoughts. And that doesn't mean denying reality. The reality is it may happen. The reality is that each one of us will in all probability die of something, hopefully at a very old age and hopefully with minimal suffering. Unfortunately, that may not be true for all people. But perspective, yes, there's in every moment a danger of succumbing to a disease or some other situation that will end one's life. People get murdered and they're innocent. People cross the road and a drunk driver 
It happens in life. So one of the things to reflect on is, yes, it, it could happen, but there's no evidence right now that it's going to right now. And the fact is that if one is alive, there is the hope that that won't happen, that which we fear the most. The other kind of irrational beliefs is, uh, are, let me say it again, the disputes could be, can I really not stand it? Well, the fact that the person is alive is evidence they can stand it, they just don't like it. It would help give perspective to reflect on the fact that throughout human history, there have, there have been periods where millions have endured similar or worse bad conditions, challenges, and a good number of people then didn't survive, and a good number of people then did survive, and a good number of them went on to have high-quality, meaningful lives. And the ones who survived who didn't probably were ones who were in the habit of dwelling on the rotten things that had happened more than they were dwelling on what they had been had to be grateful for in their present. So again, back to going through all of the irrational beliefs that one identified that contributed to creating that terrible fear, asking where is this evidence? Where is it getting me to think this way? Is it helping me or hurting me? And so dispute, dispute, dispute by asking those questions, each of the irrational beliefs. And then the next step is to come up with effective new beliefs, not Pollyanna BS, not unrealistic kind of happy la la la, it's all going to be okay. It may not all be okay. But, you know, the, the flavor of REBT is realistic optimism because where there's life, there is hope for most people. And to come up with healthy new beliefs, such as it's very concerning what's going on. I can do the best I can to be responsible, not to catch the disease nor give it to others. I can do my best each day to find creative pursuits despite my restrictions to engage myself in that, you know what, I may not have even made time for before these restrictions where I was busy going out and about or doing my work out of home. And so coming up with healthy new beliefs that we believe, again, not it's all going to be for the best. It may not all be for the best, but it can contribute to a more meaningful, enriched life if we apply ourselves. It can empower us to go through intense challenge and come out the other side knowing we've done our best to use the potential we have, to use our minds, to focus on what still is good despite the threats and bad stuff, to choose to look for what's great we can be grateful for every single day despite and including the tough stuff, to choose to do good for other people and reassure other people, even in moments we may not be reassured, but to do good for others. Again, we may not see them in person, but via FaceTime or phone or, or send a card. Remember when people, I still do that, you know, just write cards, stamps, they're fun to receive. Do something for others as well as oneself. And to come out, because this will not last, this period. I, I use the example of COVID. Yes, many, too many. One would have been too many have died, more, it seems, will die. And many of us who are watching will survive. And right now, we're alive. And right now, we can choose to work on cherishing the fact that we're still alive. 
and focusing on good we can do and focusing on being creative and gentle and practicing patience and reminding ourselves that as organic biological creatures on an organic biological planet, this will change. So, my suggestion, if a person is suffering from intense fear, is to think things through. Often a person will think, I'm so afraid because, and then they might self-medicate or they might do anything else to distract or they might, I don't know what. Or they can choose to evolve as a human being, to accept the reality of finiteness and that there are some things we can't change and so many things we can create and change. And last thing I'll mention is if you go to my website, debbiejofielis.com, there's uh, one page with a self-care sheet and it's free <laughs> and you can go through the steps there. You'll see one of the gifts Albert Ellis gave us in REBT is the ABCDE of REBT. A, activating event, write down what happened that appears to have caused your suffering and then B, um, Sorry, that is, you go to C. I know normally A, B, the Michael Jackson song, A, B, C. But in this case, A, C, B, you go C, the consequence. So identify the unhealthy emotion or behavior you want to change. Remember, change is a choice. We can't make anyone else change. We can try to inspire them, but it's their choice. But we have the power of our own emotional destiny, okay? So identify the clearly with precision what's the emotion that we want to change or the behavior. I'll stick now to the emotion of fear, intense fear, terror, anxiety. Then we go to B, which in this case stands for not just beliefs, irrational beliefs. And we do the detective work. What am I telling myself? And you look for shoulds, oughts, musts, absolutistic thinking taking things too seriously, blowing things out of perspective, damning other people or life or oneself. Right? This is all on that handout. It helps you see the difference between rational, healthy and irrational thinking. Write them down and then you dispute each one in the way I briefly described and it's written there how you dispute. You come up with healthy new beliefs and to get them in and reinforce them, write them down and repeat them every day, many times a day, let's say minimum of 50 times a day. That's not that many. Repeat them to yourself or out loud or sing them if you want to be creative and you're stuck indoors <laughs> for at least a month and longer. So anyway, there's a resource that, that can help, I hope, as well. Please, please, if you're afraid, think things through. You're still here. You're able, I hope, to hear and comprehend what I'm saying. This period will pass. Have Ask yourself, have you been dwelling too much? I'm not talking about head in the sand. We need to stay aware of what's going on and consider what to do and not do. But I'm asking too much. Are things out of balance? Your choice. Some people, I have to focus on this. No, you don't. Isn't it sufficient to focus on it enough to be informed and then put on some music, put on some dance, look at the sky through your window. There, there's, there's creation that changes all the time that's magnificent. I'm pointing there because there's my window. You know, find, find things. Um, if That's if you're alone, if, if you're with family you love, focus on enjoying time with them. Now, that leads me to a lot of couples. <laughs> uh, it's been reported have had difficulty during this time because they're stuck together because of COVID. And so it's been an opportunity for them to work on getting closer 
or to, to own the truth that they may have not been aware of or had distractions from in the past. Nothing, 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 Albert Ellis used to say, is awful unless you tell yourself it is. I know that sounds like an overgeneralization, but when I'm quoting a master, I'm not afraid to do so. Thank you for that. Uh, now, it's uh, 11 minutes after uh, the hour. Uh, we're scheduled to go up roughly 90 minutes. So at the bottom of the hour, we'll conclude. Uh, one of the issues that I want to bring up, Debbie, is uh, the question of spirituality. So many of our viewers are interested in questions of life after death and kundalini phenomena and, and a lot of things that, uh, as much as I loved Al, and uh, uh, he used to think of these things that are dear to my heart as bullshit. <laughs> and I, I'm under the impression that your work with uh, REBT is softening that approach. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but but I also want to say that Al softened his approach um, in his final years during the years that I was with him. He used to, I believe, well, he was a lot older than me. I hope you all realize that. Today would have been his 107th birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to Al. Happy birthday to Al. Happy birthday, birthday, birthday to Al. Um, so certainly in before I was born and even after, he was very fervent, fervent atheist. And in the years I was with him, he sounded more to me like an agnostic, what he would say in in the years uh, that I was with him, he would call himself a probabilistic atheist. And, and he, he said, if you can prove to me, if I have proof that there's a God or, or Kundalini or this, then I'll believe it. But up until this point, he would say, I, I, Albert Ellis, haven't had sufficient proof. Um, so isn't that an honest thing to say? Now, you started, Jeff, with, with spirituality. Al was one of the most spiritual people I, I had the privilege to know. And once he was asked, um, one of the last conferences he spoke at, actually, where he shared, uh, he was talking about many things, and, and we, he and I, had presented, which he hadn't before, my, my being in his life on REBT and Buddhism, because there are many similarities and a few striking differences. But I would say more similarities between Tibetan Buddhism, because there are many schools of Buddhism, aren't there? Anyway, um, so someone said, well, you know, you're such an atheist or something like that. Well, what are your views on spirituality? And he, he defines spirituality. You know, words matter. In REBT and general semantics, words matter. And so what's your definition of spirituality? And Al said, well, if your definition of spirituality is to care about and want to help, and to help other people, then you can call me spiritual. And I sure call him spiritual. He, he was spiritual. And I feel REBT has strong spiritual components. Unconditional acceptance, hello, unconditional self-acceptance, unconditional other acceptance, unconditional life acceptance. REBT, like other psychotherapy approaches it's not our business to talk about or encourage any religion and some people mistakenly uh, confuse the two or think that when you say religion it means spirituality and vice versa no so according to REBT spirituality includes um, caring about and caring for other people and 
you know, some religious people or spiritual people would say, well, that is a, a, a description of godliness, isn't it? <laughs> or acting in, in a highly spiritual way. Um, so he, he definitely, from the get-go, promoted not just self-interest but social interest, caring about and doing for others, um, unconditional acceptance, as I've already mentioned, and cherishing the gift of life. You know, because he was ill from infancy onwards till his death, that he suffered with this or that physical malady. So he was no stranger to coping with physical pain and challenge. And also as a very controversial figure in the world, not only the first to loudly challenge Freud. I mean, Adler did as well and Jung broke away from from Freud's, some of Freud's dogmatic assertions. But when Al first presented in 1956 uh, on REBT to the American Psychological Association, he was booed and, and jeered and called stupid and simplistic So, and, and called the devil, you know, as time went on, even though psychology accepted his approach. He was very, very often called on to make comments as an authority psychologist on radio, newspaper, magazine and TV. This was before social media and computers. And a lot of people called him the devil and should be killed and blah, blah, blah. And so he, he endured hatred from many, and yet he continued to practice principles of REBT. He experienced physical pain. He continued to practice principles of REBT. At the end of his life, when people who, some of them he treated as if they were his own children, and it appeared they worked against him and got rid of him for their own agendas. And, and uh, again, I won't get into that now, but they acted so badly. It was, it was probably the most sad time in his life feeling so betrayed by people he had loved and given so much to, not just professionally but personally. And there's a lot of um, coverage of what was going on, him being fired from his own institute, and there was a quote there where he said, I hate what they're doing, but I don't hate them. And as someone who was with him all the time, he wasn't just saying that to spew his philosophy. He believed it. And he even, he even had compassion on, on some of them. He said they're thinking in disturbed ways. They're, they're desperate to get what they want. You know, they, they don't have the bigger picture. And so... So all of that is, Al, I think, was very spiritual in those ways. REBT has those spiritual components. He entrusted me to kind of continue. Of course, there are other brilliant REBT teachers and therapists that stick to his approach. Unfortunately, my understanding is people in the Institute that still bears his name are, are combining REBT with CBT, which you defined earlier, Jeff, and so it's kind of a hybrid, and I hope people who use that benefit, but Al was against that, and, and I, I think REBT is holistic enough, um, so I stick with that. So uh, I and other teachers do stick to that pure REBT, but making it relevant for the here and now. I lived in an ashram for a few years. I meditate. I've had experience of energy and learned about kundalini and chakras. So unlike Al, I don't call that BS or anything else. I say embrace your experiences, whether you do or don't experience them, and above all, use them to enhance your human life and the life of other humans and the planet.
Uh, I wonder, Debbie, if you feel that you've had any personal communication uh, with Al that might rise to a level of being more than just an experience of grief or uh, an emotional fantasy. I don't know. There have been times where I've felt his energy, his presence. Is that him or is that my cellular memory of him? Is it his energy that's in my heart? At times I've had a deadline, I have to write a chapter for a book, I'm going, I don't know how I'm going to do this, I don't know. Um, I sit my backside down and I start writing and there's a flow and an inspiration and I read it back and I think, wow, um, was that fully me? Is there some higher wisdom, be it Al or a universal source that just came through me? My honest, I'd love to say yes, yes, and he visits me and sometimes, you know, he pats me on, on the tushy and I, 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 that wouldn't be honest. What is honest is I don't know, but I do experience energy akin to his and my mother's and my father's and others I've loved and lost and an energy that sometimes is bigger than this limited mind. That's my answer. That was a beautiful answer. Uh, here, here's a question from Sigifredo Sarabia, who says, from a psychological uh, point of view, from REBT's point of view, are you ever in the business of telling your therapy patients you are wrong? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. First of all, the people I work with, I, I usually don't, well, not, I don't use the word patient because there's this implication if you're a patient, you're sick in some way. And some people actually don't even like the word client because it's like a, sounds um, such a what's what's transactional thing the the people I work with um, I don't impose my opinion on them I don't believe I have the right to be an authoritarian figure knowing more than them what's right or wrong for them. Now, I probably do have more knowledge about REBT. I may have more knowledge about what's healthy and unhealthy thinking and self-enhancing and self-destructive. In all probability, I can be more objective than they can be about what's going on. If they have self-hatred, in all probability, I have the, the ability to demonstrate more compassion and unconditional acceptance to them than they may be doing at the time. So I can't think of any times I have said, and I would be extremely concerned if I ever heard myself say, you are wrong. Now, I might vigorously question something they say. Where's the evidence? Where is it getting you? In my attempt to help them assess whether they might be a little bit wrong or very wrong or not wrong. <laughs> so it's not my role to be what some people might call God <laughs> Or, or an authority figure. I own what I bring to our interaction. And it is my goal, not only to do no harm, but to do as much good as I can. And part of doing much good 
is to empower a person to begin, if they're not already thinking in healthy ways, so they can better assess what works for them and what doesn't. By the way, the word wrong this is very absolutistic. If is anything fully right or fully wrong, that would be another question the client and I or the person I work with and I could discuss. So the goal in therapy, if possible, model unconditional other acceptance so they can learn to give themselves unconditional other acceptance. Model rational thinking so they're hearing it and you can model those principles so if they're willing, they can start thinking in those ways. Teach them, offer them tools they can use on themselves. So it's like you know, teaching people how to fish rather than having them rely on you to give them all the fish. That's uh, been an expression told in the past, yeah? Um, in conclusion, I'm sure you get it by now. No, I would not tell anyone they're wrong. All right, but explore. Well, Debbie, we just have a few minutes left. This has been a wonderful conversation. I'm so delighted to reconnect again with you after several years. Uh, I want to remind our viewers uh, before we sign off that uh, they can visit your website, DebbieJaffeEllis.com. Uh, and you mentioned you have this checklist for people to go through, a document uh, if they're experiencing a crisis. Maybe uh, we just have two minutes left, but I know we have hardly even touched on uh, the COVID uh, pandemic that we're all experiencing. Uh, obviously, much of what you've had to say is uh, relevant to, to all of that, but do you have any uh, short final thought to share with our viewers? Please don't allow yourself to catastrophize. As I said earlier, if you're listening to this, you're doing a lot better than people who are not able to listen to anything anymore. You're alive. You have a choice. You can choose, despite the seriousness of what's going on, to do your best to keep safe and keep others safe and to choose to find something, at least something every day that you can enjoy, to choose to do something every day that can maybe bring a smile or uplift others or another person. You can choose to remember what you're grateful for and that this too will pass we all are going to die. We're not there yet. Even if any one of us, may it not happen, succumb to whatever illness and the end point is death. In the here and now, we have the opportunity to choose to enjoy the fact that we are alive. Can Most of us can taste most of us can see. Some people can't see, but they may be able to hear and so on. There are things we can choose to be grateful for. To be alive is, is truly an opportunity and a gift to those who refuse, refuse to catastrophize. It's our choice. That's a wonderful thought. And uh I want to thank you once again for being with me, Debbie. Uh, I want to also remind our uh, viewers that we have two previous interviews with you in the New Thinking Aloud archives. If they want to delve a little more deeper, they can uh, go to our listings page. They can link to it from the uh, New Thinking Aloud uh, channel page. Uh, so uh, with those thoughts, I will sign off and uh, we'll end the live stream. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for being with us.